and number two. Everybody there, say amen. Amen. God will stand if you're able. We're going to read all 18 verses of chapter 2. Now, will we get through all 18 verses? Maybe, maybe not. But we're going to try. Verse 1, Hebrews chapter number 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to His own will. For unto the angels hath He not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visited him? Thou madest him a little lower than angels. Thou crownest him the glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he hath put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under Him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor there, that He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became Him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth, they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is, to be, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for this morning. Lord, we're so thankful for the singing and the praising. Lord, we're so thankful for these people that are going to go on the trips and serve you this summer. Lord, I lift up all the prayer requests this morning to you. Lord, I just ask and pray that you would bless this service, that you would move amongst us, Lord. Lord, I'm so thankful for you. Lord, speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. While y'all are being, uh, being seated, I got a special guest here with me this morning. A few of them, actually. Right here in the middle, my Uncle Tony. Wait, Uncle Tony. That right there is my mama's brother. He is one of my heroes. And his daughter, Natalie, is right there. And then my little cousin, I want to see one of them right now, little Brent right there. But uh, y'all, I want y'all to know, that's one of my heroes right there sitting there. But with that being said this morning, uh, Hebrews chapter number 2, I, I, I'm going to work forward then backward a little bit. If you look right there in verse 6, it says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man? What is man? Who are we? That's what he's more or less saying. Who are we? Why are we here? For what purpose have we? And you know, a lot of times in life, people may ask that question. Why am I here? Why did God create me? What is my purpose in life? And you know, before I ever looked at this, before I ever, uh, remember I told y'all a couple weeks ago, we're just going 
go through the book of Hebrews. And yet, I did not know that this is the sanctity of life Sunday. And yet, here we are asking the question, what is man? Who is man? And we talked about it a little this morning in Sunday school. And I want y'all to know and to understand, as we read in Genesis chapter number 1, the Bible teaches us very clearly, God created us. In his own image. God created man. In his own image. God gave man. Dominion. Over everything in the earth. Matter of fact it says it right there in verse 7. It says. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowned him with glory and honor. And didst set him over the works of thy hands. God has placed us. Over all of His creation. Will you think about that for a second? We are over the lion. The king of the jungle. We're over the whale. The king of the sea. We're over everything. And uh, somebody, I think it was Miss Karen, was saying this morning in Sunday school, she said, I am terrified of snakes and spiders. But yet... She can go get a gun and shoot that snake, right? She has power over that snake. Amen. We drove vehicles. We built buildings. We create technology that has changed the world. Animals are still eating off the ground. Amen. God gave us special dominion. And not only that, He created us in His own image. Somebody might say, what does God look like? I don't know. But He made us like Him. Jesus came in the form of a man. And the Bible says He didn't take on the form of angels. He took on the seed of Abraham. He came in the form of man. The same form He created in His likeness. And God gave us purpose. And what is that purpose? To love God serve, and worship God. And you sit there and you ask yourself, well, what is man? What is man? Well, I want to read y'all something this morning. I'm not trying to bore you with some more, but I found this, and it gives a brief description of the two different versions of man, and then God's version of man, and I found it somewhat interesting. So, let me read these two to you real quick. It says, the world tends to view man in one of two idolatrous ways. Number one, materialism. Sees man as a composed of nothing more than the material components that he has been able to gather throughout his life. What his accomplishments were. His intellectual, emotional, and spiritual aspects are nothing but products of his material nature acting according to the rules of physics and biology. Implications. Man is not responsible for his behavior. The environment is to blame for the unacceptable behavior. Leads to the emphasis or social programs. Big government. Man is not distinguishable from other material of creation. Therefore, he has no dignity or inherent worth. Animals or even plants have the same inherent worth as people. Man's identity is not in any way related to God. Therefore, man is in some sense ultimate, which is idolatrous. The Bible teaches us in Mark, what has a man gained if he uh, uh, gains the world and loses his own soul? You know, yesterday uh, on ESPN, uh, I love watching the UFC fighting, and, and they were showing some UFC fighting and some of these fighters, the best fighters in UFC. And since these fighters have gotten popular and famous, guess what they're driving? These Lamborghinis and Ferraris, and they live in these massive houses, and they got these big gold chain necklaces, and these fancy haircuts, and all these clothes are all right. But guess what? When they die, all that will stay here. All that fame and fortune goes away. All that materialism stays. Somebody else gets to fight over it when you're gone. The next one is idealism. 
sees a man as essentially a spiritual being, and his physical body is foreign to his essence. The body is nothing but a shell for the spirit of the intellect. Implications. Man's body is neglected. Deeds done in the body do not pollute the essence of the person. Male and female identity is a biological accident. Do we not see that in today's society, in today's world? Where it don't matter what you're born, you can be whatever you want to be. It is almost like saying God made a mistake. God made a mistake creating you a man. When you were supposed to be a woman. And so now man has decided we can create surgery to change that. You know, I, I, I like that old joke. I've told y'all several times before where scientists got so smart that they decided we're going to go to God and we're going to challenge God. We believe God. We can outsmart you. We don't need you anymore. We can do things without you. And God says, all right, well, I challenge you to a little friendly competition. Let's make man like I do. And the man says, okay. God says, from the dust of earth. Man says, all right, I, we can do this. We get our guys together. We can do this. So they grab them up some dirt and they go to work and the guy says, oh, no, no, no. Get your own dirt. Amen. <laughs> God don't make mistakes. God created each and every one of you perfectly. That's right. Perfectly. You are not a mistake. The way you were created was not a mistake. You are special in your own way. And nobody can take that from you. Now listen to what this says. The Christian view holds these two aspects, that material and the spiritual, together in perfect harmony. But the Christian view goes beyond that. The Bible presents man in the proper context of the creator and creature relationship. Man is created and sustained by God. Genesis 1, 27, Acts 17, 25, and 28 tells us that. Man is a person and is therefore capable of making moral choices. Let me say something on that note. Somebody said, I don't have free will. I can't just do whatever I want. That's a lie. You can do whatever you want. However, there's consequences, whether good or whether bad, for every choice you make. You are, how many times has any of you been forced with a gun to your head to do something? 99.9% of the time, you do it because you wanted to do it. Or the peer pressure carried you through it. But nobody made you do it. We do things because God gave us what is called free will. To choose and do whatever we want. What does it also say here? Christ, the God man, is the perfect representative of what it means to image God. I love that. I love that. God created us in His own image. Sin, sin destroyed that relationship. Sin destroyed that picture. But yet Jesus came, not of the seed of man, but the seed of God birthed through a woman and became that perfect picture again of God, man, perfect. Now this is what it also says. As a result of the fall, God's image in man is corrupted, but not lost entirely. Remember that. Not lost entirely. Is man basically good or basically evil? Man was created very good. Evil came in and destroyed man. And destroyed man's relationship with God. But, God's image is corrupted in every aspect of man's being. God's image is not entirely lost. God restrains sin through the operation of common 
grace. And finally, God's image is renewed through salvation in Jesus Christ. Yes, we are corrupted. Yes, we have been destroyed. Satan has destroyed our lives when he fed even out of that first life. And we took it. The other day, me and Mr. Williams was doing something. We were talking about fishing. And he said, fishing ain't nothing more than a jerk waiting on another jerk. <laughs> and when you think about fishing, that's exactly what Satan did. He waved his head in front of us. If you've ever watched a bass, they sit there and, and, uh, and then you just give it a little jerk. And then all of a sudden they go back uh, and they start eating and all of a sudden you give it that right jerk. Wham! They can't take it no more. That's us. Satan will dangle it and dangle it and wave it and dangle it as pretty and as long as he has to. Satan's patient. Until we fight. And all throughout our lives, we are full of this corruption where we have taken the bait. And then all of a sudden, through the blood of Jesus Christ, it is all washed away. Amen. And we're made into that same image. Christina, the last couple of weeks has been just, she, she caught me. She caught me off guard. She said, well, we have our same name when we get to heaven. I'm like, I don't know, you know. I hate when y'all do that. Y'all don't prepare me or nothing. Y'all don't give me one I, I'm not prepared sometimes, you know. And even still, I don't know that I'll know the answer. I said, I don't know. <laughs> ain't been to heaven yet. I'll let you know one day, right? But, but as, as she hit me again this morning, I'll walk in and take the baptism. Are we going to have to say, hold on a minute, let me think. And then it started coming to me. What does the Bible say in Revelation? And the books were open. And another book was open. And behold, the Lamb's book of life. And guess what? If your name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, Jesus will say, depart from me, for I never knew you before. Yeah, you'll have a name. Matter of fact, I told us, what about the Mount of Transfiguration? When Jesus took uh, John and Peter up there to the mount, and all of a sudden, here comes Moses and Elijah. Now they lived several hundred years, maybe even a thousand years before John and Peter and all them. But what did they see? They knew them, and they knew them by name. Your name can be cleared, can be washed away by the blood of Jesus. It don't matter where you've been, what you've done, how many times you've done it. God wants a relationship with you. Amen. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, you can have that. Now, I told you I was going to go forward and go backward. Now look at verse 1 and 2 of Hebrews. The Bible tells us, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should <coughs> let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first begin to be spoken by the Lord. Y'all, we live in a time right now where it is busy, 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 busy. They create devices for us to help save time. And what do we do? We add more things to our life to where we don't have no time. <laughs> Amen. It, it feels like we are in a mad rush Rat race everywhere we're going, everything we're doing. Rush, 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 rush. And who do you think is feeding it all? The Satan. Because listen to what it says right here in verse 1 again. He says, Lest at any time we should let them slip. Like I said just a minute ago, what's the most important things in the world? It ain't your car. 
It ain't your house. It ain't your bank account. But yet, that's what we work the hardest for. What's the most important? Our family. <coughs> Our family. Our own flesh and blood. You know, that's the only thing you can take to heaven with you. Is your family. There's the things stay here on earth. And then what do we do? We neglect we neglect Jesus. We neglect teaching them Jesus. We neglect teaching them how to accept Jesus. In today's world, the main one of the main things that's being attacked is identity. Who you are. And you say, I don't know. Think about it for a second. If a child is not accepted by a certain group, they will go to a group where they are accepted. They will dress in ways you never expected your child to dress. They will hang out and say things you never expected your child to do. And why? Because they are looking for acceptance. And then what happens is as they get older, they follow this crowd that is leading them astray. And then all of a sudden, one day you're like, you need to be in church. You need to have your life straightened out. And then it's too late. Jesus said, go into all the world, teaching, preaching the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. If you lose your own home, you've lost everything. What is the profit of man if uh, Billy Graham preached to the whole world? You know, they say that he preached to more people than anybody that has ever lived on the earth. Millions. And what would it have profited him if he preached to the whole world and yet his own children died and went to him? What good would have been done? You know, as if you read over there in Timothy, as a pastor, if I can't take care of my own home, I sure ain't supposed to be taking care of y'all. That's God's word. Our homes are being neglected. The Bible says right here, lest at any time we should let them slip. Let our own children slip away and let Satan and this world destroy them. Instead of, now look what he says in verse 3. If we neglect so great salvation. We neglect it. What is this great salvation? It shows them that somebody loves you. That Jesus died for you. And that you are loved. You know, that's what everybody's wanting to do. To just feel loved. Just to feel like somebody cares about it. That's when you have that great, wonderful joy in life. And that's what Satan is trying to steal. Look on down with me real quick. Verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, I don't know about y'all, but on your TVs lately, every other commercial, it seems like, is what about your retirement? Have you taken care of your retirement? <coughs> Am I the only one saying that? Y'all seeing them too? They want to know about your retirement. The world really cares about your retirement. But guess what they don't care about? Your dead. Do you know what, I've told you this several times before, what the death rate in America is? 100%. You're going to die. But guess what? Not everybody's going to get to retire. Some will die before they retire. Why don't they care about your death that is guaranteed? Why? You see where the emphasis is? It isn't on your eternal soul. 
But Jesus did care about that. When I did brother, when I was a part of Brother Roosevelt's funeral, y'all, I, I, funerals are depressing. I'm just gonna be honest with you. Y'all know that. And, and I told somebody not long ago, I said, if I don't have to do another wedding or a funeral, I know I'm a preacher, but if I didn't have to do another one, it wouldn't hurt my feelings. Amen. <laughs> Weddings just they, they're just a long, drawn out process. Amen. <laughs> funerals are just depressing. But let me tell you something. When, when I did Brother Roosevelt's, I got a dose and a taste of what a funeral is supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. I got a dose and a taste of victory. You know, you can you can sit there and, and you know, I know Miss Payne's hurt, I know the family's hurt, and I know it's a sad, sad time. But I'm gonna tell you something. That is a victory. Amen. That man is better than ever before. Paul said to live is Christ, but to die, but to die, but to die is gain. Paul said, you know, it, it does y'all good for me to be here, but I'd much rather be at home. And yet, what do we all fear? How are we going to die? Maybe someone's going to fear death itself, but how are we going to die? And then, what about the people that don't know where they're going to go when they die? But right here it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with the glory and the honor that by grace of God should taste death for every man. Now look over with me right there at verse uh, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power over death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, every single one of us is scared to death of that day when we close that casket. But yet, Philippians says this. Or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians says this. Chapter 15. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, we don't have to fear death. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to... I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, the thing I really worry is leaving Amy and the kids in such a weird, wicked, crazy world. But you know, if, if you've got Jesus Christ, it's going to benefit you to go home. All those UFC fighters I talked about yesterday that have fancy cars and all this stuff, and, and yet in retirement, they want you to give them their money, your money, I'm sorry, they want you to give them your money to help them help you manage it. So that you can live a long life happily ever after. Now, if I'm Jesus and I'm selling heaven, hey, you're going to die. Sorry, you're going to die. But if you accept me, you get a mansion, you get streets of gold, you get pearly gates, you get crystal seas, you get eternal life. There ain't no more need of makeup and aging products. There ain't no more crying. There ain't no more sadness. There ain't no more ibuprofen and etc. and pain pills. Amen. <coughs> it is eternal wonderful. Now, which one do you want? Now, here's your option. <coughs> Death, eternal life, eternal damnation, eternal pain and suffering. Our streets are good. 
That's a no-brainer, right? Anybody can sell that. But yet people are dying and going to hell every single day. It is the lie what the world is telling us. Jesus paved the way. He made us the most wonderful bargain plan situation you could ever ask for. And yet people are believing the lie. If you told somebody right now, if you're coming right down here with me, I'll give you a hundred million dollars. And you knew you trusted this person, right? And they like a stranger you just met. I'm like, really? Yeah. Come on! I mean, it's a no-brainer what Jesus has offered us. It's a no-brainer what Jesus has given us. And you are guaranteed to die. You have no choice. You know, I'm surprised Congress, as crazy as they are up there, had to try to pass a law where it says you don't die anymore. <laughs> I mean, that, that's how ridiculous they get sometimes. Well, if we just pass a law, they can't do it no more. Okay. It is guaranteed. It not, but Bill Gates, the wealthiest, richest man that has ever lived, that the world's ever seen, got like $80 billion dollars. He needs to give some away. No, I don't know if I need that much money. He's going to die. He can't buy his way out of death. The most popular people that has ever lived, the greatest singers that have ever lived, are going to die. There ain't nothing they can do about it. And finally, this morning, I want you to look at me. Look at verse 12. He told you we're going to go forward and backwards and all kinds of ways. Say, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. Ladies and gentlemen, this is God's house. And it's in this house where you can be restored where you can feel the love of Jesus Christ. It is in this house that Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus was the rock. And Jesus right here, and this verse said, In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto Him. People say, I don't have to go to church. If you go to heaven, no you don't. But you show sure missing out. You don't know what it's like to have them up here singing and just praising and worshiping. You don't know what it's like to be carrying the burdens of years or days or weeks and come right here and give it to the Lord. You don't know what you're missing to not come to God's house every single week. You know, I know some Sundays are better than others, and I know some Sundays it's just like, nah, nah. I leave it at midday. It's been a few times I told Amy on the way home. I said, they ain't never going to let me preach up there again. That was terrible. <laughs> I know that. You ain't got to tell me. But then there's some Sunday mornings where it feels like we're walking on clouds in here. Amen? Amen. Where it feels like you just float because the Holy Spirit is picking you up all Sunday morning. And you just leave out here like, yes, I can't wait to come back. And I can tell when I ain't been good, when it's been good, when it's been bad, because y'all won't show up, amen, when it's been bad. I know, I know. But, but I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing better than being plugged in to a church, to, to God's people, to praise God, to worship God, to have a relationship with your Creator, where you can see what we're singing these praises, where you can lift your arms and you say, thank you, Jesus. There's nothing like it. Amen. Nothing. And it says it right there. He says, in the midst of the church, I will sing and praise unto thee. And then it says, I love this, and God will put in His trust back in the south. How many of y'all have ever prayed and it didn't feel like it went no higher than your nose? <clears throat> but how many of y'all have ever prayed and it felt like you were sitting side by side with the master? Amen. Amen. That's what you want, ain't it? 
You want to pray and be heard. Now the Bible says He knows our prayers even before we pray. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit is praying for us. But there ain't nothing like being broken and saying, Lord God, I need you. And you hear Him and He hears you. And He said, don't worry, child, I got you. There ain't nothing like it. And that's what He's saying right here. When you come in here and you praise and you work, you know what? Uh, Athens, Georgia. I'm not going to off. Athens, Georgia has Sanford Stadium. Ninety-something thousand people get in there screaming and praising the Bulldogs. And guess what? They might lose. As a matter of fact, they probably will. <laughs> Y'all know. But yet, you can come into here and you can scream and you can praise and you can worship God. And we win. Every time. Every time. You never. That's why we Y'all, we don't have to live it. 
We can come here. We can praise and worship. You can praise and worship to me. But Jesus wants a relationship with you. There's no need in fearing death or loss or sorrow or something. Jesus paid it all. He has given you total and complete victory. And this morning, don't live in fear. Don't live in doubt because you don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. Trust in the one that holds tomorrow. This morning as we stand and this altar is open, if you would like to become a part of Woodland Baptist Church, you come. If you say, Jonathan, I want to accept Jesus Christ, you come. If you want to be, uh, have accepted Christ and have never been baptized, you come. This morning, this altar is open. Everybody can stand.